Distinguished Professor and Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies in the School of Education at the University of Kansas. Her research focuses on equity issues in higher education related to the academic labor market, the needs of international faculty, women faculty, and most recently, the policy response of higher education institutions in the wake of demands for dual career couple accommodations and work family balance. Dr. Wolf Wendell is the author of numerous refereed journal articles and books, including Academic Motherhood, How Faculty Manage Work and Family, and The Two-Body Problem, Dual Career Hiring Practices in Higher Education. She's an editor of the Ash Higher Ed Monograph Series and serves on the editorial board of many notable publications in higher education, including Research in Higher Education, the Journal of College Student Development, and the Journal of Student Affairs Research and Practice. We're very lucky to have her with us here at, uh, at the Institute today. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Wolf Wendell. And, and thanks for uh, Amy, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, Suzanne, thanks for making this, all the arrangements and making all of this so smooth and easy, even though travel is never smooth and easy as uh, Eric knows because I texted him and emailed him at, late at night on Saturday saying, hell, my flight was canceled. <laughs> I have nothing else going. Uh, it's all good. Okay. Uh, uh, I just realized that I probably need to update my uh, CV, which was pulled from the from the KU website because it says that I'm the editor of the Ash Higher Ed Monograph series, which Former. doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and uh, uh, so anyway, I was like, oh, I should update that. Uh, but I am the editor of the New Directions in Higher Ed series, which is sort of the adjacent publication. I uh, do that with uh, Jillian Kinsey. So uh, we're always looking for either uh, edited uh, volumes, uh, collections of, uh, of uh, around topics uh, and or individual articles that take us in new directions. So there's my little advertisement plug. Uh, I'm gonna, all right, here we go. So uh, the title of this talk is Gaslight We Keep Girl Boss, uh, How Women's Roles in the, uh, in the Academy Have Changed or Not. And, uh, I uh, got the title from my eldest daughter, uh, who is a 23-year-old college grad who's now living in Prague. And uh, I said, I was giving a talk for Women's History Month. What should I call it? And she said, Gaslight uh, Gatekeep Girl Boss. And I said, what? <laughs> and uh, she said, oh, it's a very popular meme. And, uh, it's, uh, and, uh, so, it, and so I, I spent a little time sort of researching uh, the meme before I decided that that was where we were going to go. Uh, and I, I learned, I read several, many, many uh, academic and some not academic articles about uh, Gaslight Gatekeep Girl Boss, uh, which they described as the live, love, laugh of this generation. I suppose I would be the generation of the live, love, laugh, except that uh, when live, love, laugh came out, I, I don't think, now we mock it, but when it came out, I think people were sort of enthusiastically live, love, laugh, and they had this big posters. I really, it, it, it's things in their in their decor, right? You could buy it at Home Depot or at the, uh, wherever you want to, Walmart, wherever you want to buy your, your home decor. <clears throat> no one would put Gaslight <laughs> <laughs> Girl Boss on, uh, as home decor. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is, it's not a, it's a kind thing to say, uh, to someone, uh, but I did read a lot about it. So, so let, I, let me give you a little bit of the origin, not to be uh, too geeky about this, but gaslight, as you probably know, is a form of manipulation in which you try to uh, trick someone into uh, uh, questioning their own perceptions of reality. Uh, and uh, uh, gatekeeping, of course, is keeping people out. <laughs> Of, of spaces where they belong. And Girl Boss has a super interesting history, right? So initially, actually, Girl Boss was seen as a good thing. So you would accomplish something, you'd say, Girl Boss, or whatever it is. And it was about in the, in the early 2000s uh, when Sandberg wrote Lean In, and there was a lot of sort of literature. There was lots of sort of popular press about how this new generation of women were, uh, taking over women, you know, running women only business or going into uh, industries where women had historically not been allowed and were uh, sort of 
taking over and doing all of these great things, but with a friendly smile. So people knew that they were not scary women. Uh, and so they were sort of, they were both powerful and likable was sort of the, but what, as you would imagine, what happened over time is that a lot of these uh, folks like Cheryl Sandberg, like the founder of Glossier, like, you know, really were doing this smile work, we're doing, we're, we're powerful leaders, but didn't really change the environment in which they were in. They ended up sort of just reifying it. So that even though these companies were run by women, there was still harassment in the workplace and there was still all this sort of troublesome behavior. And uh, so Girl Boss shifted its language from being sort of a compliment to being a really problematic, uh, terminology and, and 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 interestingly with as with all things even you, you say it's a meme who cares but there are scholars who look at this stuff and, and research it and uh you know the the origin of the girl boss was that the, this idea that is uh as women get older and they become more powerful that they're perceived as being less likable and that the term girl boss was this desire to be powerful but still have people like you and, uh, and so that's where it sort of, uh, sort of origin. And that's really sort of interesting. You sort of think about higher education and you think about women's leadership and you think about how those spaces, uh, you know, who's in those spaces and how they come to be. Uh, that recognition as it sort of turned into a, a, a negative was that you changed the bodies of the people who were in leadership, but you didn't change the table. You didn't change leadership at all. And, so this idea that these girl bosses uh, were trying to initially thought to be dismantling the system were really just cosmetic changes and they didn't accomplish much and what they did accomplish they accomplished actually by gaslighting and gatekeeping other folks out of the space so the other thing to say about gaslight gatekeep girl boss is it's a very white cisgender uh uh framing and so it, it it's not all women who are who could have claimed the positive side of girl boss. It was certain women from uh, who looked certain kinds of ways, who had certain identities, et cetera. So I think it was a you know it, again I sort of went down the rabbit hole of looking at this meme, but I did think it was an interesting way to sort of think about and frame the uh, the, the role of women in higher education, because um, we might have replaced we we might have be at the table perhaps more than we used to be, but have we dismantled the system or are we just reifying what already existed? And one of the most interesting uh, pieces I read, academic pieces I read about Gaslight, Gatekeep, Girl Boss, uh, fully in Audre Lorde's work, uh, where you know she wrote about how systems like white supremacy and patriarchy um, are difficult and chief, the, the famous quote is, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will enable, never enable us to bring about genuine change. And girl bosses were put in powerful positions, but they never changed the system. Uh, they just used the master's tools to, to be successful. And so as we think about women in higher education uh, in this Women's History Month, the almost the end of Women's History Month, we have to think about whether we're just replacing we're new bodies at the table, or are we actually changing the structures that exist? So I'm thinking about you as an audience of, of, of scholars of higher education uh, in different phases of your career. And I'm thinking about the, the literature that exists in the field about higher education, some of which I've contributed to. Uh, and I should say that it's really, a, a, when you read this literature, if you immerse yourself in it, what you'll see is that it, it very much focuses on cisgender women. Uh, it excludes folks that are non-binary and and, uh, uh, and those who identify as women uh, or trans or who, and, and, and just really that voice is left out. And so it's, it's a very particular uh, group of women who are, whose voices are included and, and whose aren't. It also, at least in the work family literature, uh, until very recently has focused almost exclusively on white women. Uh, it excludes women of color, uh, international women, and rarely uh, addresses anything that's intersectional. Uh, 
again, I'll put my, my own research in, in, in being problematic in that space as well. Um, it focuses on the work-life research, of which I do a lot, focuses very much on traditional families and traditional gender roles. So there's not a ton of research that's out there about single parents or LGBTQ parent families or uh, families with other structures. And so uh, these are all areas for, 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 for folks who are looking for, for, for new research topics. These are all areas that are open and where there's a lot of room for, for, for a need for new research. So most of the research about work life, about women in higher education focuses on women on the tenure track, not women in contingent roles, and focuses on women mostly at research universities, not at regional comprehensives, not necessarily at community colleges. And I see more and more research out there on these other pockets, but in terms of sort of the mainstream, when you look at the, uh, the academic mother work or the scholar mothers or the elephant, you know, I, I, most of the books and most of the mostly cited articles are in research universities. Very strong focus on US institutions. Uh, some conversations that are happening in international spaces. Uh, and the international spaces are super interesting in work life and women because many of them have um, uh, allowed people to take maternity leaves, which you could see is like wonderful. And it's super hard to get back into the field. Uh, dual career couple issues play out really differently in other cultural, in other uh, 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 contexts as well. And so we really do need to sort of understand this, this literature in a proper more cross-national uh, stance. And a lot of the scholarship focuses on individuals. Let's go back to the, the girl bosses. Focuses on the girl bosses themselves and less on the structures and the policies and the practices of the institutions and or of society that are creating the, the, the situation that we have. And really the, the focus should be on changing norms and, and policies, not on changing people. I often in my own, in, in my talks and research that I do, I often use the metaphor of many scholars who do this work use a pipeline metaphor, right? So we talk about the leak pipeline, we talk about all the junctures in which there are leaks. Uh, and uh, I'm a homeowner, so I'm, I'm blessed to do that. But if my pipe is leaking, I don't blame the water. The water's just doing its thing. I call a plumber and I fix my pipe. Uh, and we all have done our research and focused on the, the water and why it's leaking and why it's dripping out and, and, and not focused on what are the structures that exist that are perpetuating that. So if that, if that metaphor works for you, that might be call a plumber. Sound like an ad. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I sound like an ad for, but something. So the status of women in higher education, I think you can sum it up. So, so in the, the five minute university version of this is what will you remember five years from now after you, uh, if you remember anything about my talk, you'll just remember this, the higher, the fewer. <laughs> the details we can get into where the specifics are, but if you just remember that, that can pretty much sum up a lot about what we're gonna say today. So women have made a lot of progress. Uh, in higher education. So they have earned 67% of all undergraduate degrees in many institutions of higher education. They're the majority. Uh, uh, they earn 50% of all doctoral degrees. It varies by field, of course, but, uh, uh, but, then, but then as you go up the pipeline, uh, you'll see a sort of a, a smaller percent. So women represent a much smaller share of faculty at research universities. And they're overrepresented at community colleges and less selective regional comprehensives. Uh, then they're less likely to be sort of you sort of go up at each rank. And if this is my this was my uh, big finding for uh, from reading all the, the all the reading I did in preparation for this is if we assume that there's gender equality, that people are just that there is no discrimination, no problem, that people are just gonna work their way up, it will take 35 years from now to have gender parity at the full professor level. I don't think it's really safe to assume that there's no gender, in, that there is gender equality and that all the systems will work out. So if we have to wait 35 years just for women to have parity at the full professor level, I mean, I think it would, we'll it's gonna take longer. <laughs> but 35 sounds like a long time, I'll be retired. I don't know how many other people in this room will be retired, but some of us will be, some of you all be full professors by then. So. Uh, 
not only are, are uh, women, so women aren't equally distributed across discipline and field. And so women tend to be less likely in the higher paying fields, uh, STEM and finance. And where women have made inroads in some STEM fields, those fields now pay less. So uh, women, there's a large number of women in veterinary science now uh, who are becoming vet, vet, uh, uh, veterinarians, but now uh, vets make less money now than they used to before it was a female dominated profession. So as women go in, the value of the, of the degree lessens. Uh, so uh, women uh, make uh, less money at, uh, than men for every rank and at every institutional type. Uh, now I have some experts on, on, on this here and with some progress, some less, less progress than, and, and some things that sort of uh, get in the way of, of, of that. Again, as if you think of administration as higher, depends on if you're a faculty member when you think that, but uh, Richmond uh, hold about 43% of chief academic officer uh, positions at colleges and universities off the, around the country, far more, over, uh, far more at less selective, uh, to your institutions, less selective sort of spaces. That number does not look anything close to 43% at research universities. And there are 30% of, of college presidents are currently identified as women. Uh, again, not at, not at research universities particularly, although again, you see some, some numbers changing. So again, what do you, what do you want to remember? <laughs> Yeah, there was an old Saturday Night Live skit sketch to get it probably that, that was a that was a the five minute university and it was like you know, I would teach you Spanish you would do como esta usted muy bien gracias and that's all you would remember five years later uh, the comedian was a his father Guido Sarducci he was dressed like a priest and he, he was like I would teach theology so I, where is God God is everywhere. I would teach economics, supply and demand. But th this is what you would remember. So he gave everyone a final exam and then uh, they got a little orange juice for spring break and then he gave them their diplomas. So this is, the, 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 this is you know, if you can, it's probably, there's probably things that are really problematic about that sketch, which I haven't watched in a while. But I, I, I always, when I teach a class, I always say like, what's the five minute, what, what do you need to remember? So, <laughs> don't, 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 if, it, if, it, if you watch it on YouTube and it's really like problematic, <laughs> uh, so uh, there's lots of different ways, little different literatures that you can use to frame this. And I'm not going to go through all of these, although when we get to question and answer, we could talk about some of them. But uh, some of the ones that I use, and so these are like sort of conceptual lenses or frames that I use in my own research. And uh, so ideal worker norms, I talk a lot about that in my own work, this idea that uh, you know, the academy faculty positions started out with a monastic tradition, right? So uh, people were buried to their work. They didn't have external uh, calls and things that they didn't have to do laundry and cook and take care of kids and do all these sort of extra things because those things were taken care of either by the community that you were in or they were taken care of by your life uh, so that you didn't have to worry. I and mean, we have set up all of these sort of ideal worker norms about what it, you know what it takes to be a successful academic and we built we sort of baked it into the system um, and then that gets combined with this idea of being a parent being a caregiver is a uh, particularly if you're uh, uh, the mother uh, in a mothering position in your caregiving it's, it's also very greedy so you have these situation where you have sort of two very time consuming greedy things happening at the same time if you are uh, in a caregiver role and how those two things sort of compete with one another. Uh, you'll see in my research, research, I look a lot about life course uh, perspective and trying to look at not just what happens when you enter into the academy or not just when you're pre-tenure, but to look at how careers grow and change over time and how families grow and change over time. The, the demands uh, are, are not uh, similar. I, all of this takes place in the context of neoliberal university structures that care about budgets with student credit hour production and uh, uh, declining budgets and all kinds of other things which have created sort of a crisis orientation in higher education. So anyway, there's, 
we, we, we can go back to this and talk about more of these things. I sort of want to, but I, I, I sort of do use different lenses to sort of help me think through uh, some of this research. So I thought this was sort of fun, my shards of glass. So there's all kinds of really cool metaphors, right? To think about uh, women's progress in higher education. And, 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 and a lot of them, are, I think, are sort of interesting if you sort of think about where they, so there's the glass ceiling, the glass ceiling breaking through the top and achieving success at the top of their field. Uh, there's glass balls. That literature, that, that metaphor is used a lot uh, to describe uh, women in contingent faculty positions. They take on a contingent faculty position in a glass ball because there's, there's no place to go from there. Uh, glass escalator, this idea that uh, uh, it's written a lot about, uh, about men's advantages in female dominated fields. So a man in nursing or men in elementary teacher ed get uh, hidden advantages and wins that where women who are doing the same work are not recognized. So I thought that was interesting. The glass cliff, well, the glass cliff, right? So that women are, are uh, sometimes placed in leadership positions uh, but then, uh, you know, so, so you're asked to be a department chair in a department that is really problematic. Uh, anyone see the chair? I was about to say. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> right, so, so the chair is a perfect example. She's put in, uh, she's put in a, a, gla a glass cliff situation uh, where, and then when she fails, she fails because she's a woman who couldn't handle the job, not because no one could handle the job. Uh, leaky pipeline, we talked about that. Mommy track. That's metaphor. You said the frozen middle ladder. But the phenomenon, the phenomenon of women getting stuck in mid-career and not going up for full and sort of getting getting to and, and some of these terminology is used in business, some is used in higher education, but uh, the sticky floor. Not only do I not get to go up, but I'm stuck. Uh, and then of course a lot of people uh, don't like the idea of a, a you know this linear uh pipeline and that they sort of recognize that the career uh is a maze uh less a less a ladder less a pipe uh and that and that in fact it's less linear and that one of the actual difficulties is that um people who have caregiving responsibilities oftentimes women um their career path is less linear they enter in and exit out in different kinds of ways and yet the the accepted career path is, is linear. And so how is it that women, how, how is it that you allow people to step in and out and do you, and how is that you, uh, I, I think the labyrinth actually is a really, is a really helpful metaphor to describing people's paths in higher education. I think it's become much less lockstep and linear over time. Uh, now, whether policies recognize that or allow that or not is a, another issue. Um, so, my focus is a lot of work life, um, and uh, it may be a work life, uh, maybe an explanation for why the fewer the higher, uh, higher the fewer the higher the fewer maybe happen. And so I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of of language that I use. So when I talk about work life, I don't use the word work life balance ever. I just don't use the word balance. Uh, anyone who has Home responsibilities should know that you never feel balanced. Balance is, uh, you know, any one moment I might feel balanced, but in in, in general, if you use balance, then it it I think it sets up ideal worker norms or sets that people are somehow some mythical being out there is feeling balanced and I'm not, and therefore I'm failing. And I think we just should take that out of our vocabulary. So I use work life integration, work life management, work life but I, I don't put the balance in there. And I took, I used to say work family. A lot of my early research talked about work family. Uh, and now I use work life. Why do I do that? Because regardless of your parental uh, uh, situation, regardless of whether what you're doing, you have a right to a life. And what matters and, and, and people who value what they, valuing what someone does outside of work and, and recognizing that that helps you be better at work is important. So only talking about family, I think, limits us and limits the way we think about this. I try in my own research to use caregiver and not parent. 
because people have different care roles. Uh, sometimes they have multiple care roles. Sometimes they only have one care role. Sometimes they're caring for a spouse or a partner. Sometimes they're caring for a parent. Sometimes they're caring for a child. Sometimes they're caring for an adult child. Sometimes they're caring for their own health. But I do think thinking about us as caregivers, sometimes we care for our own students. Uh, so thinking about us as in caregiver roles is really important. Um, much of the research about work life focuses on women as they are often hold primary caregiver roles. And, uh, but it's really, really important to know that men also face problematic gender roles. There is a really important research uh, base out there. Some of it written by Margaret Salee, who talks about academic fathers, who talk about the, you know, we have policies that are written in gender neutral language, but men are told, no, that, no, 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 don't take that family leave. That's not for you. But then if they don't, then of course, who is doing all of that primary caregiving role? I mean, so we really have to think about this as, uh, as broader than just a, a women's problem. So we'll, we'll do that a little bit. So when we talk about work life, you know, the whole life out there, uh, we just think about all these different sort of constructions about things that, that happen in people's lives. So we can have, might have dual career couple issues, like that. We might have parenthood issues, but parenthood isn't always the same, right? People are a single parent, you could be a blended family, you could be in a same sex relationship, you could be adopting a child, you could have some combination of that, you could give birth, I don't have that on there. Uh, and then you have a variety of folks that you might take care of, elders, children, grandparents, spouses, and partners, and then you have your own health. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on in the life part of the work life of Asian. Um, and I want to make a note, and, and I talked about who's left out of the literature, but I also wanted to make a note that the literature that is out there talks about difference, makes a difference. So uh, we do not all experience uh, caregiving in the same kind of way. There are lots of differences that come uh, uh, because of our race and ethnicity, our national origin, our sexual orientation, our gender identity the kind of families we have, our socioeconomic status of both our, what we're in now, but also in our uh, where we came from and the intersectionality of all of that. And if you just have to sort of think about, for example, the way COVID, not necessarily past, uh, affected different folks with different identities and how people uh, from uh, historically marginalized backgrounds for the brunt of the impact of, uh, of COVID and then anyone with a caregiving responsibility add to that on top of that. So, so it, the lack of focus on, uh, on not focusing only on cisgender women, white women is really, really important because how folks navigate uh, caregiving in the academy is gonna, differ greatly depending on people's uh, identities. So then if we go to work, the emphasis on the work life, we also have to talk about complicating this, right? Because it's not a single, an academic career isn't a single thing. And so I, I know you all know uh, from folks who, who uh, from your faculty that institutional type difference is important and dramatic. So if you're an academic in a two year versus a four year, teaching focused position versus a research focused position, of course, differences by field, where you do your work, work. Think about the caregiving needs of someone who needs to travel to archives to do their research. The caregiving needs of someone who's an oceanographer and has to go out on a ship or a geologist or who works in a chemistry lab and has a whole team that they have to work with and have to keep the team running and the grants running and the postdocs and the versus someone who writes novels, right? And sits at home and writes, so, or sits in the coffee shop or sits wherever they do and writes novels and their work is more solitary. So think about work life as, while there are a lot of similarities across field, how we do our work differs so much. Uh, and, you know, Bernie Clark's, writing, right, about how, how academic life isn't a thing, it's all thing, so always comes to mind for me. Of course, we can have different stages in our career, different assistant, associate, full professors, 
postdocs, graduate students, uh, but then also the kind of, of instructor we are, are we full-time or part-time? And if we're part-time, is it a, uh, are we retired? Are we working full-time in another field and teaching course? Are we piecing together a bunch of part-time gigs because we don't have, we want a full-time one? Uh, so even part-time, right, or contingent faculty don't all look the same. And so really, really thinking and breaking that down. So when someone says, I want to do more some research on work life, or I want to do research on women faculty, or I want to, and I'm like, okay, which group? Because we can't generalize across because they, li they live in different worlds. Um, so this is a really small font, sorry about that. So, if we talk about a pipeline, this is the, the tenure track academic career life cycle for caregivers. And uh, Kelly Ward and I, our research uh, has looked primarily at early career, mid career, and then mid, mid career. Uh, we did a, a longitudinal study where we interviewed 120 women who were pre tenure who had infants uh, and asked at different institutional types and asked them, How are you making it work? What's your life like? What have, what are you doing? How do you feel? And then we asked, went back to that same group of women in mid-career, so seven years later, how are you doing? How are you managing? What is your life like? Blah, blah, blah. And then we went back to them seven years later. Uh, and so uh, this is a, 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 a super <clears throat> five-minute gross overgeneralization, but I would say in the early career, uh, you know, people were really worried about tenure and this whole idea of this biological clock and tenure clock ticking simultaneously was a, was, was a big, you know, it was, it's a lot of pressure. They were happy, they had young kids, they had tenure, they had this time clock, they had to get everything done. And they felt time was such a variable for them. And they spent a lot of times talking about diapers, daycare, breastfeeding, and maternity leaves. I need to, you know, I took a leave here and how do I do to make sure my kid is safe and how do I get through and, 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 and that was sort of this sort of preoccupation. Uh, but they also talked about their love for the field. They talked about their love for being an academic. They talked about their love for being a parent. And I, I you know, Kelly and I used to joke around, and I'm, I'm not sure it's not true. I actually think it is true that we are one of the only people who have ever described academic life as joyful. Like I, I just think that most of the time we talk about how hard it is, how terrible it is. Oh, no one would want to be, no one want to be an actor. And you know, like it's not that terrible. It's a lot of autonomy. There's a lot of flexibility. You get to study what you want. You get to do what you want. It, it actually, compared to many other careers, is a really good choice. But I think we're also worried that what the that society, the larger, the state legislators think that we're mowing the lawn at eleven o'clock. <laughs> they're in the morning and they think that we only teach two days a week what the heck that's you know how you know, but so we have this sort of inferiority complex that we uh, i'm i'm, I'm put put some things together here, but we don't think that we want other people to know how hard our job is and so when we're talking to undergraduates we're talking to graduate students we stress how hard it is we don't usually tell people, oh, it's so awesome. I got to go to my kid's soccer game today, or I get to do this, or oh, I, and, and when we don't talk about the joys of our work, I think about all the people we might be scaring away who could be brilliant academics who say, oh, I don't want that life. I don't want to do that. I want to be able to. And so we have to do a better job of somehow threading that needle between making people know that this is hard and serious work the life of the mind, et cetera, but it is conducive for many people to join it, many people who haven't joined it before. And we have to be careful about the message. So Kelly and I talked about joy and I, 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 don't, I don't take that back. There is, there is joy in this career, uh, even if there's no time, <laughs> and even if whatever. Uh, and, but women in the early career talked about needing mentoring and support. Uh, and the other thing I think is interesting is that they, they were perfectly, they were productive, right? So there is something about uh, being able to, when you go home and you have to not work and you put it aside for a little bit, then you don't have to work. And then uh, it, when you go back to work, you're more productive. And then when you're home, you're, oh, so there is something about this, this buffering of having multiple spaces, whereas uh, pre-tenure folks who don't have caregiving responsibilities have to feel on all the time. And have to feel like oh, I have to work all the time, and you know they're no more productive. They just stress about it all the time in different kinds of ways. Uh, 
All right, that's my early career. My mid career, I just say this the policy, the practice, we only focus on maternity leaves. We only focus on birth. We only focus on helping people in that first semester or the first year in which they are caregivers. But if you're a parent or you are a caregiver, you know this is a lifetime commitment. It doesn't go away. I probably could look at my phone and look at my college graduate daughter has probably texted me some question about something, right? So, or my college junior daughter who's going on spring break to New York is probably saying like, well, I'm a, still a parent, regardless of whether my kids are 20 or are uh, just born. And it would be, and what happens in mid-career is that there's a lot of scheduling. So there's a lot of car, talk about carpools and activities and schedules and planning and, 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 and anyone who has a, 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 a kid in middle school or high school, eventually they, maybe they could try it, maybe. But eventually you still have to worry about where they are and how to get them there places. And so there's a lot of that for women in, in our sample. There was a lot of service teaching, a lot of care work happening at work. Uh, there was a real hesitancy to go up for full professor. So many of our women were technically ready, could have gone up, but didn't want to deal with the politics of it, didn't want to, didn't feel like they were ready, didn't feel like they were, were waiting for someone to tell them they were ready and they were going to wait around for a long time or for someone. And they felt kind of stuck. Many of these folks were, it had dual career couple concerns that they were in whatever, now their spouse and their kids were situated. They couldn't go anywhere they sort of they their salaries were relatively going lower because of compression and other people were leaving and they were feeling like they couldn't go away and they were by the way in need of mentoring and support they're just a big theme here uh and it's a mid mid career oh i'm going through it too much but they're in need of mentoring and support like family and work career issues are still prevalent for people who are uh uh 14 years into, into their careers. It doesn't necessarily. We can go back to this. So I have a, I get to occasionally do new research. So this is new. No one's seen this yet. So, uh, so I did a, a really interesting uh, 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 analysis of some coach data. Coach is a, a national faculty satisfaction survey. Uh, and uh, we had, um, I mean, they had, so I had 1,700 people who served in chair roles uh, at four-year institutions. And we looked at um, gender differences between the male chairs and the female chairs. So again, this isn't published yet, so you're the first to see it. Uh, uh, so what we did was, well, first we just did, well, so who, who, who are, what are the characteristics of these, of these two groups? And what we found is that um, male men chairs were more likely to be full professors they were more likely to have higher salaries, they were likely to be older, and they were more likely to be at research universities compared to the women department chairs, who were more likely to be associate professors, who were more likely to be younger, who were more likely to make less money, uh, and who were more likely to be found at um, non-research universities. So we the opposite of that. And then, um, and we looked at statistically significant differences of the satisfaction variables, and there were 17 variable satisfaction variables. And of those, there were significant differences in 12 of them, with men being more satisfied on every single one of those things than women. Super interesting. And, um, uh, no, and by the way, no chairs, or, chairs are not particularly satisfied. So just to be clear, <laughs> they're not like happy group, but in the, they're also, the, the women chairs were less satisfied than, than the men. And so what we ran, we ran a, discrimin a canonical discriminant function to sort of see if we could differentiate, to see what the variables were that would differentiate men and women. So it's not, uh, we don't, people don't use discriminant function very often, but we sort of dusted it off of, uh, out of a, a little uh, sage green book and Really, and we got we got this lovely little graph, right? So this is men and this is women. They don't even look like it barely they barely overlap on, on, on your curves, right? So you if you know uh, the satisfaction level, you know some characteristics of uh, men, you can predict, I mean of chairs, you can predict which ones are, are men, which ones are women. There was a, I think it was a, a 
23% uh, ability to discriminate between the two, like a uh, uh, predictive ability. Um, and the best discriminants were time spent on research and salary. Those were the, 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 the strongest discriminants between women and men department leaders. Uh, and then the moderate ones uh, were perceived importance of mentoring that one receives both inside the department and outside the institution. Uh, that was another sort of helpful way of discrimin uh, discriminating. So I, I just thought that was kind of, even at the chair level, we got, we got some pretty wacky gender stuff going on. So uh, giving a talk in a couple of hours to the National Academy of Sciences, and they wanted me to look at the care needs of international faculty in STEM and, and also contingent faculty. And I thought, I'll share that with you all. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, foreign board faculty make up in, in STEM. So I'm switching only to STEM here. But about 20% of uh, faculty in STEM, they were a third of all new hires and they surpass US women and people of color in terms of hires. So caring about uh, foreign born your international faculty is important. And I should just tell you, it's super complicated to track international faculty because it's not like students. Students, you can track this. We, we have visas, right? That so you can like, oh, they're on an H-1B visa. But with faculty, once they get hired, they get merged into the, as, as Asian or as black or as Hispanic, they don't get count. And, from, and many of them are US citizens or have green cards or, you know, so it, it becomes super hard to track. Uh, international faculty once they're in faculty. And I, I know, for example, we, at, we got KU to uh, track whether people, uh, our faculty were, uh, when they entered, did they have a visa or were they a US citizen? And we were able to figure out, for example, that while we have, I don't know, 180 Asian faculty, only two were born in the US. So, but they all get called international, I mean, they all get called Asian faculty. They don't, there's no differentiation. And so that's, I mean, that's a, just a super interesting, you know, institutionally, nationally, it's a hard group to sort of uh, keep track of. In some other research that uh, I've done about, uh, I'm also using coach data, we differentiated whether someone was foreign born or whether someone was foreign educated in terms of international faculty. And we found significant differences in terms of satisfaction level and uh, uh, productivity and mobility and likely to be likelihood of being promoted uh, if someone was um, foreign educated. The foreign educated were different than the foreign born. So anyway, it's important to sort of think about how you're gonna measure these things. But back to this, we ran uh, for, this doc, I ran coach data on using 2012 to 2018. I found I had six population of 67,000 faculty from 164 four-year institutions. Uh, former grad Amanda helped run this stuff. So anyway, 88% of them are US citizens. Uh, international faculty were more likely to be married with children than domestic faculty. 10% had caregiving responsibilities, and that was the same for, for both groups. Uh, and uh, international faculty were statistically significantly less satisfied with all measures of work life. Uh, they were less satisfied overall, but they were more productive. They produced uh, uh, more research. There are new concerns right now for international faculty about being targeted, both in terms of discriminatory behavior, but also by things like the FBI for, for having connections with institutions in their own home countries. And so that's really, putting a damper on folks' uh, uh, ability to be successful in their field. Uh, they're also less mobile and less likely to hold uh, leadership positions. Uh, so I think that, uh, and I would just say, in specifically working at, looking at work life, uh, a lot of uh, folks in STEM are in dual career couples. A lot of folks in STEM have very, come from countries and, and cultures with very traditional gender roles. And so it's often the woman who, is uh, doing the caregiving. And I, we found two patterns. One, either having a mother or mother-in-law who comes from their, their country and, and lives with them and helps with caregiving, which is great until that mother or mother-in-law needs care. Uh, or living very far away from their family and having no support and no sense of community. 
and that becomes, of course, equally difficult. Um, and I just will add, I read this super interesting article about, about something called vampirism uh, in STEM. And I've not heard of this before, but basically the idea is there's lots of dual career couples in STEM. The uh, woman, part of the couple often will choose to choose, is that term lightly, choose to stay home and take care of kids uh, and or go into a, a contingent faculty job. Uh, she is often in the same field as her husband. The husband, uh, after a long day in the lab, comes home and says, hey, I'm working on this thorny problem of, uh, uh, and I want to know if you would want to, to help me think through it. The woman will often do the calculations, think through, come up with the brilliant idea. The man will then go back with uncred not crediting his wife and get credit for it and end up being very successful and the women get nothing. So vampirism, it's a thing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yikes. Uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, uh, I was like, uh, so we can talk more about it. And then uh, non tenure track faculty. There's very little research about non tenure track faculty and, and work life. Uh, contingent faculty are sometimes called the fast food workers of the academy. And actually, uh, uh, in many cases, a, a contingent faculty make less money than minimum wage. Uh, make, you would make more money working at McDonald's in some states than you would being a contingent faculty member paid for by the course. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a problematic space. And if you are an adjunct faculty member, there's little, no work-life uh, policy or recognition. Uh, if you are in, in, in an in adjunct one course, right? If you don't teach, you don't get paid. You don't go to the lab, you don't get paid. There's no There's no... Uh, uh, that is changing a little bit for folks who are in um, full-time contingent or full-time contingent positions like uh, teacher and faculty, professors of the practice, etc. Some institutions are cluing in and or unions are helping people clue in to the idea that that group of faculty needs uh, support, needs a career ladder, needs that oftentimes they fall into this sort of hole between HR policy and faculty policy, faculty governance policies. And so uh, it's not really clear whether they're staff or whether they're faculty and which policies apply to them and which ones don't. And do they get paternity leaves and do they get uh, access to resources and are they allowed to use the daycare on campus and are they uh, uh, do they have an office in which to use a breast pump and a place to store their milk? All of these kinds of things. And so there's, there are a lot of work-life concerns for contingent faculty, both full-time and, and part-time. Uh, not a lot of support, uh, institutional support for them. They've really fallen through the cracks. I see glimmers of attention paid to them here and there in, in spots. I think Adriana Kizar's work uh, at, out of USC uh, has really the Delphi project has really done a lot to amplify uh, both the needs, but also the some policy and institutional policies and supports for this group. Uh, and I should just say that this whole idea of choice, I'm a feminist, so I'm a big fan of choice, but the idea that you, that this is a better choice for people who want to have uh, work life management balance, whatever, it cuts you off from ever, uh, from, from a career ladder. You can't just say I'm going to go to part time and take care of my kids, and then I'm going to jump back into to a tenure stream position. It, it, in fact, at many institutions, policy states that they won't consider people who've been in contingent positions for a while. They only want to get uh, newly minted docs, uh, baby docs, in, into those these new tenure track lines. So people feel like they're here and they're doing this work. But also, if you think about the work, like it's a, a four four or five five teaching load, and maintaining your scholarship so that you can pop back into to a tenure line it's, it's just not a feasible option so this is a group that needs care uh and isn't getting it uh i'm gonna look at my time i think i'm probably going too long uh sorry uh there's a i i did a study i tried to do a study right before covid where we were going to expand our population of uh folks to include people in, in different family structures. So people who were uh, single parents, people who were in uh, 
uh, LGBT families, people who were trans, who were parents, people, and so to try and sort of blended families and say, so we, we engaged uh, in this uh, attempt to do this research. And my first interview was held March 13th, 2020. Uh, and so the, where the person just cried, just cried, cried and cried, cried. Uh, and so the, we thought that, and so we ended up doing the study, we ended up being more about how work life uh, and faculty in COVID than being about gender and gender identity, because people weren't in a place to the sort of break down. And I mean, they were put in a position to break down. They weren't in a position to think about sort of the gender identity pieces of all of this. It was more survival mode. So uh, I plan to continue on with that research uh, and, and explore the gender family structure piece of it. But right now, what I got was this is hard. <laughs> Uh, and I think, uh, you know, when I look at the, uh, you look at the, the literature, I guess I just highlight this, the gender differences in division of labor, the additional labor that happened when kids, you know, it was, you know, I got my kids to school, so now that I can be a professor during the daytime went away, uh, and that people couldn't be a professor during the daytime because they were being home, they were homeschooling and taking care of all of these things, and many people, um, you know, had chosen families or families they had to cut themselves off from. So they were in it alone. And it was just a very difficult time. And the, the, not just in academia, but you've seen what, what's happened with the gender division of labor relative to that. So any progress we thought we had made, really the second that that happened, we realized we hadn't really made that much progress. Uh, the other thing was this permeable boundaries between public and private. Like everyone, you know, Kids made cameo appearances in every single one of our uh, <laughs> of our interviews, uh, and what was public? You know, it used to be sort of higher ed space is public space, and then you go home and it's private space, and that just got super blurry and weird, uh, <laughs> as you would all know. So, um, more to come. I'm gonna. Yeah, I, I, I think I should just stop and let you all ask me questions, but. I just think that there's, uh, we have to think about work life as a, a lifelong proposition. We can't just make it about what are we gonna do for a pre-tenure mother who's having a baby. Uh, we have to think about it as being, how do we help people have, uh, have fulfilling lives outside of work? And I don't think that institutions are like benevolent structures, I, I think. But I do think that there is enough research that shows that if uh, someone has a, a happy and contented life then uh, outside of work, that they, they are more productive at work, they're better workers, and they're more likely to stay. So I do think you can make the case that this is an institutions, even in, a, in, a, uh, in the world that we're in now, that it's in the best interest of institutions financially to help people uh, be successful both at work and at home. And that we have to think about that as uh, cross genders, across differences and across career spans. So it's not just fixing the problem for one little demographic of folks. Um, you know, being a girl boss is not the solution. Meeting <laughs> uh, uh, in is not sufficient. Uh, we have to be able to, uh, to think about the structures that we're leaning into. Uh, I, I think we have a lot of, and, and, and we can talk about, I'll, I'll stop in a minute, but we can talk about some of the things that have happened. Some of the, for example, we created some policies during COVID to allow people to stop the tenure clock and have a COVID statement so that people could do that. You know what's happened is that that has created a situation where women stop their tenure clock and put caregiving statements in, and many people we're more productive during COVID. So it really, and, and, and so if you think about just from a salary perspective alone, if I delay going up for tenure for a year, the cumulative disadvantage to my uh, retirement, to my income, all of those kinds of things. So we did something to sort of be helpful and recognize the differential impact, but it has long-term differential impacts uh, that will further exacerbate salaries and, and other kinds of problems. So we have to, we have to go beyond sort of the immediate fixed to thinking about more long-term sort of fixes. Um, I'll stop there. I'm gonna un unshare. I could go on for two days, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, have some time for questions. Yes, let's take questions. 